just to get the staff, but he's while I'm talking. I can't just want to start. It's a long morning. I have to get started. All right. All right. Good. Good morning, everyone. Glad to see you all here. Good morning. Glad you're out. We're just discussing how really mild the weather is, but it's still wet. It's just still wet all the time. So, yes. Good morning, everyone. Um, later on, I'm going to do a little, another little doggy piece by Backed by Popular Demand. So I'm going to do one of my other dogs. So I think I don't have any announcements. Nobody came with me announcements apart from tonight. Um, tonight serves at half six. It will be Christians and sport. And the, the ladies will be coming for that, the, 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 the sporty women. And the sermon will be done by Russell Bowers. So come tonight. So I'm sure it will be very interesting if you can be here tonight. So we're just going to start this morning with a brilliant opening praise. Um, come people of the risen king it's a great joyous one to start us off for thought, a little slot I'll do just before the prayer. So this one is about Holly, Holly Hampton. Oh, I'm doing the click here. There we go, when she's here. So this is Holly. And Holly is our oldest dog. She's 10 years old. She's the oldest of the dogs we have now. Um, and this this very popular, the Spot the Dog competition. Now, it should be a bit easier this time. So we've got, there's Frodo in the front. And needs his haircut. There is, oh, is my, I've lost my clicking. There's Gary, he's the smallest. There is Bessie, and there is Holly, just in there, tucked in. All right, that's the four of them. Okay, so, oh, I keep forgetting to do that. So there you go. Holly has been with us for a long time, and you can tell by two people you might know, uh, Morgan and Anne Murray. So, so yes, Morgan's also going to do it. So, <laughs> So she's been with us for a very, very long time. And so she's also seen a lot of coming and going in her days. So 
These are the dogs we had before when Holly was around. So there is Smokey. We've cut her head off back in there. But there is Smokey who passed away first. She was 14. There is Holly sleeping in a strange manner <laughs> when she was a puppy. There is Kerry who she was 16 when she passed away. And this one there is Patch. So we're not too sure how old it is. We rescued him from a CC. So a CC thought he was two. The vet thought he was about six. So if the vet's right, if the vet's right, he passed away when he was about 12. So, so she's seen a lot, of, a lot of sadness. And every time a dog passes away, she gets quite, she takes it quite personally and got very upset, got very listless, went off her food. But eventually she came around and would, would get used to the, the, the other dogs and, and um, kind of work, work through her grief. So there we go. I don't know if you can see that. It's quite hard to notice. So if you look up there, you can see that bit of her ears, a slightly different color. What happened is not that long ago, we needed to take our conservatory roof off and put on a, a sunroof because um, it, was, it was falling down. So we moved all the furniture on, men were in doing building work, and she, um, she started to lose hair off her ears. She just got stressed and lost the hair off her ears. She doesn't like change uh, and she doesn't cope very well, but eventually one thing settled down, the, the hair started to grow back, not back on her ears. So there you go. That is, Holly always tries to fit in. There she is, trying to squeeze in. Dogs do love their comforts. And there you go. But she, try, but she can't get on with everyone. I don't know if you know that. Notice that there? But the cat is looking directly into the back of her head. <laughs> she's, she's looking very nervous. But Holly does love her comforts. That would be four cushions, if you can count those. There's four cushions she's lying on. There you go. So yes, yeah, sometimes when one cushion just isn't enough, I think she's just got two there. So, and Holly might be like some people you might know. She tries to get on with everyone, but sometimes she doesn't. She gets stressed when things happen that are out of her control or she doesn't know it's gonna, it's gonna happen. She suffered a lot of loss in her life, but she's learned to move on and cope with it. And she loves her comforts. And there's one other thing that she is really good at. She is a great dog of faith. For 10 years, she has waited at my side of the table. I have never fed her from the table, but every day she waits, silently, patiently, wagging her tail. From all angles, that's my, that's my knees. And she's come up from under the table to see if that, that made any difference, if she's gonna get fed. And no, she doesn't get fed at the table. So she believes with such conviction that she actually convinces some of the other dogs that this will be the day that they'll get fed at the table as well. She often draws a crowd. There you go. But she's not obsessed. She does like long walks in the park uh, in all weathers. It's not actually, Martin think it would make you think it was so, chucking it down that day. It wasn't actually that wet. It was slightly misly. <laughs> he's, he's dressed for some sort of tornado. Like you like your comforts too. <laughs> So, oh, and I'm not clicking things. Oh, there it is. So, right. So, there I am. I'm eating a magnum. There you go. If it's louder. So, she has, I don't know if you can spot her there. She's quite hard to spot there. There's actually another dog down there who's just trying to get up on the photos, just trying to get on the couch. You can't really see him. But she has an unshakable faith that one day I will share my magnum with her. She never gets impatient, and she never tries to snatch it from me. Although she's fairly close, she could do it there, but she doesn't. She waits for it to be given to her, and she doesn't get it, let, it, let her get her down. She wags her tail and goes on about a day, even though I don't give it to her, until the next meal time. There she is. There you go. Oh, that fits in. There you go. So she's a great dog of faith. Faith is being sure of what you hope for and certain of what you cannot see. It's from Hebrews 11, verse 1. So I'm just going to leave this with you. One thing I'll leave with you is that is be more holly. Don't come around to my house and watch me eat at my table. But believe that when you come to God's table, which is what we're going to do today, and ask for something, he will deny you no good thing. And if we don't get it, it's because God has a different purpose for us. Holly knows that she's loved and taken care of, but she'll never know why I won't let her eat chocolate or human food from the table. But that doesn't stop her waiting every day at her master's seat, 
and you need to know that the master is me and not Martin. She never, never looks food off you, you know. So with that in mind, let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you that you give us evidence every day of your love and power in every part of our lives, even in our pets. Lord, as we prepare to take communion today, we are reminded of your great sacrifice for us and your promise to us that you will deny us no good thing. Therefore, give us humility. Help us to know that we come to you with nothing and deserving of nothing, that we have earned no reward, except we bear the promise that if we come to you, you will provide. Strengthen our faith by opening our eyes to your possibilities for us. Give us the patience to wait on your timing and not on ours. Give us comfort in our sorrows and help us realize the great joys in our life and our day-to-day -day lives. Give us the wisdom to know when we should, what we should do to further your kingdom and demonstrate your love. Lord, when we look at this world we live in, it is hard not to despair. When mad men seem to have all the power and politicians seem incapable and are motivated by self-interest and care nothing for the people that they are supposed to represent. Everything seems to be crumbling, our government, our health, our schools, our humanity, and our hope. Give us the faith, Lord, to trust in you for all things. Give us much needed comfort and reassurance that you are in control, that nothing is done without you allowing it. Help us to see through your eyes and know that your will will be done. Thank you, Lord, that we are never alone. You take care of all our needs because you love us. Hear our prayers now, O oh Lord. You know all the things that trouble us most. Guide us through our difficult days. Give us the strength as we walk through life's journey, the journey that will take us home, home to your house where you have prepared a room for us. Thank you, Lord, that we have your word, which trains and strengthens us. And thank you that you have your Holy Spirit in us, which strengthens us in our faith. Thank you, Lord, that even the smallest of our voices are heard by you. Amen. Right, so if, if we have any kids this morning, I don't know if I... We'll have some sneaking around. And then so they can go now if they want to. Off they go. Right. Just the big kids are left. So, right. So we're going to sing our next hymn. There's a Redeemer, Jesus God's own son. Which is a great, one of my favorites actually. It's great.
it's not part of the service. I'm just going to say about that hymn. I think it was one of the first hymns. I, I'd come from London and I moved here. And my friend Jim McLean, some of you might remember, I went to Ashford Girls and I didn't know um, anybody at all. And she says, come round to the church. And I think that was one of the, I think that was one of the first hymns I ever, or choruses I ever sang in the CE. And it was on, on the, um, what you call it, wallpaper. It's just written on, on wallpaper. So, see, coming from London and then going to Belfast and reading stuff off wallpaper was a bit strange. But she wanted me to come because I might meet some men. Unfortunately, I did. Thank you, Martin. So, <laughs> there you go. But that's, I love it because it's, it's, um, what's it been now? Uh, over 30 years, or about 30 years since I've been singing that. And it's still, it's still a great, a great chorus. So, it's, today's reading is John chapter 4 verse 1 to 26 and it's about Jesus and this Samaritan woman <clears throat> now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized but his disciples so he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee now he had to go through Samaria so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Joseph's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would give you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself? as did also his sons and his livestock. Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, go, Call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands. And the man you're, you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on the mountain. But you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, the time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshippers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I the one speaking to you, I am he. Thank you for that. And so, oh, I've lost my order of service. So we have, we have, I'll know this name. This is John Murray coming to speak to us now. Now, I have an uncle and a cousin called John Murray, so we might find we're related later on. So he's going to come to us and talk about the Gideon Bibles. Thank you, John. I've lost the order of service. Have you got one? That's right. Thank you. 
I was told at the start that uh, this John Murray you were speaking about was dead, and uh, <laughs> certainly not me. I might be a dead loss, but I'm not dead. <laughs> uh, thank you all for uh, the invitation to come along and speak to you and just share something of the, what the Gideons do here in Northern Ireland. It's a real privilege and a joy to, to do so. Uh, I'm from the East Belfast branch of Gideons International and just for a short time I'll try to share with you what we do and where we go in doing it. The Gideons are made up, some people think it's a sect on their own, I can assure you it isn't. We're from all denominations and they're made up of men and women who love the Lord and have accepted him as Lord and Saviour of their lives. Uh, we seek to hand out God's word in all the traffic lanes of life and believe that the Bible is the inspired, infallible and inerrant word of God and daily seek to follow him and to serve him uh, day by day. We come, as I've said, from various denominations of the Reformed faith and our aim is to share God's word through personal witness and to distribute the scriptures in various locations so that many, both young and old, might come to know Jesus, living within their lives and know the joy of his salvation in their hearts. So where do we operate? Well, we have an involvement in over 200 countries. And last year, uh, 2016, we handed out the two billionth uh, copy of God's Word. And each year uh, we hand out over 80 million copies worldwide. Staggering figures, aren't they? That's more or less who we are, but now for a short time I'll try to give you a flavour of what we do and where we go in the distribution of God's Word. Uh, firstly, we have hotel Bibles. Now I'm sure you're all familiar with these. You go to a hotel and you go up to your bedroom and the locker beside it, you open them up and usually we find the Bible inside it. That's the hotel Bible. Uh, very, very special. We have uh, many hotels here in Belfast and all but four take God's word in. And one especially, the Premier Inn down at Titanic Quarter, the one that's just opened, they had written into their contract that the contractor wouldn't receive any monies until each room had a Bible placed uh, in, in the bedrooms. There's a bit of a plug for the Premier Inns, isn't it? <laughs> Hospitals. Uh, we usually cover these on Saturday morning just to ensure that there's a Bible uh, at each bed. Uh, we were, a couple of weeks ago, we were up at the Ulster uh, Hospital and handed out there. I think that there were something like 150 that were given out. And this Saturday we are going to the new block uh, to uh, furbish them uh, with them. The reason we do it every year is that some are damaged, some are lost, and some people, whenever they're going home, take them home with them. And that's great. We encourage that. If they haven't got God's word at home, it's tremendous that they go and take them home with them. And we would uh, <coughs> encourage that. It's just great. But whatever the reason, uh, they're all replaced each year, and we make sure that each bed has one. Cover residential and nursing homes as well. And uh, for these, we have the large print testament. We have some down the front. They're quite good. Uh, they're big, but there's some who need it just a wee bit bigger. And that's that one. You could really read that one from where you sit down there. And uh, that, that's the ultra large print. And we uh, give them out round each bed again. The staff as well get their own copy. We give a copy out to them. Schools work. And what a glorious work it is. This is for uh, year eight students who have just started second level uh, education. Uh, and we would speak at their morning assembly and then we'd hand out the New Testament and Psalms at the end. And this works in full flow uh, at, at present. And usually before Christmas, we have covered 
uh, all of our 23 mainstream schools and three special needs schools. Uh, the special needs don't always uh, get a visit because they don't always have an intake. But if they have an intake, should it only be one, we still go and we speak at their assembly and then give out the testaments. The testaments, I'm sure you all know them. We read one. And we usually point out that they're red on the outside, but my, it's lovely if they're red on the inside as well, isn't it? And there's a wee bit at the front, and it's the same with the ones I'll be leaving for BB and GB. So place at the front to write your name in, so as if it's lost, people will know that's whose it is. But there's a place at the back as well that you can fill your name in if you've made a commitment to the Saviour. And that's what we long for, that many would be able to sign in the second one, that they belong to him. Now, last year, I was involved uh, particularly in a couple of uh, schools. Uh, one was Campbell College and the other was uh, Lagan College. The attention paid was great. All the right answers were given to the questions that were asked and boy, it was just everything seemed fine. But there was a very disturbing fact uh, underneath it all. One form master in Campbell College asked his students at the start of term, how many of you would attend church? And out of a class of 24, three put their hands up. And in Lagan College, out of a class of 26, two, that was five out of 50 attend church. And that's church in any shape or form. BB, GB, youth clubs, or whatever. 90% don't go in any shape or form to church. And what a challenge we face these days with our young people, all lovely young people, knowing little or nothing of the Saviour. And how we long and pray that they would find Jesus and be lovely young people for him. And so we have the joy in of bringing a message to them and speaking clearly of what Jesus can do in their lives and the importance of having a personal relationship with him. And all we give out in excess of 3,000 a year round the schools, and that's just from our East Belfast branch, many other branches, of course, in the north. In addition to this, and we have some on the stand here, we give out scriptures to all the public services. That's prison service, the PSNI, the fire brigade, the ambulance service, the army, the navy, and the air force. And these are all crested copies with their badge embossed in the front in either silver or gold. And they're always very well accepted. And we've also crested copies for uh, church organizations, BB, GB, and we have some for scouts as well. Hope soon to have uh, some for the guides. And this morning I've brought along uh, quite a number for BB and GB to leave here for your, your own uh, organizations. It's a work that we're trying to develop, and it's a real privilege just to be able to go around and hand out. We've handed out, I think it's Orangefield BB, Grancha BB, and Raven Hill. Raven, I come from Raven Hill, so obviously they would get it. Uh, we have three BBs handed out so far, so that, that you're the fourth one, so right up at the top of the list there, as far as the Northern Ireland would go. Now, on the PWTs, anybody know what a PWT is? Anybody know? No? Well, I'm not very long in the Gideons, I'm about two and a half years in it, and the first meeting I went to, everybody was speaking about PWTs, and they give one to somebody, and somebody come into their house to do a job, and they give one out to them. I hadn't a clue what they were talking about. Not a clue. And I had to say to somebody, what, what are these PWTs? And it's very, very simple. A PWT is a personal worker testament and they're very very special very special when you go a walk now i'm very fond of going a walk and i was very fond of what i saw up here about holly i thought that was just tremendous because i've got a dog buster and i walk him every day 
And if you're anywhere near the Cumber Greenway, watch out because most people would stop and have a chat with them and then I would give them a PWT, the personal worker testament. So if you see me coming and you don't want one, you have to shoot away off somewhere else. It's, uh, but inside these at the front, uh, uh, and indeed in all of the ones, uh, the, the, test, the, the scriptures that we hand out, there's a special section of where to find help when. And it covers many, many subjects. It's when afraid of circumstances, afraid of the future, bereaved, brokenhearted, and many, many more, and scripture passages relating to them. Many, both young and old, have found peace and joy in this section, and some indeed have found the Lord. Now, that's about it. But there are many, many more avenues, avenues that we cover, such as City Blitzes, the Rugby World Cup, the Football World Cup, the Euro Football. And to bring it back home, with three days we spend at the Balmoral Show, on a special time it is, and we hand out many testaments there. Many thousands of copies of the PWT are handed out, and this includes uh, foreign copies as well. We have them in many languages. Uh, our aim, you know, is to defend the faith. And how can we do that? Well, we can do it by living it and showing the loveliness of Jesus in our lives and by giving it through personal contact and giving out God's word to all. So there you are. We're involved in over 200 countries, including America, Central America, GB, Africa, Australia, and all the surrounding islands. But this morning, I'm here in Strand Presbyterian, and it's a real privilege and joy to share the work of Gideon's International with you. Ah, could I commend all of the work to you? And maybe especially could I commend your prayers for the schools and organisations and for our young people so that many of them might come to know Jesus as Saviour and Lord. One last thing. There's always some people who refuse uh, to accept the Bibles and it's important in those situations to live lives that show clearly that Jesus lives within our lives and that he's the one who makes all the difference in a person's life. And always remember that each day, each day you're writing a letter to men, make sure that the writing is true. For the only gospel that some men will read is the gospel according to you. I live lives that are worthy. And thank you for listening. Amen. Do you want to thank John? And uh, isn't that an encouragement when you hear him speak and uh, how we're able to get God's word out to many, many people, people who are in trouble. There's times when folk are in hospital and, 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 they're, and they're worried and concerned and they can reach out uh, and they can lift out one of those New Testaments or one of the Bibles and they have no clue where to look. I mean, it's, it's, it's a big book, isn't it? I mean, you open up a Gideon's Bible there's always a wee list, you know, when you're sick, when you're worried, when you're concerned. And it directs them to exactly what God would want to say to them in their situation. Uh, we've all been blessed with, with Gideon Bibles, but we do pray that, particularly our young folk, I mean, that's a shock. I mean, you think that out of 25 pupils, only a couple have a, a church connection. And that was loose, maybe with BB or GB or something like that. That's shocking. I mean, you can think whenever you were at school and that same question was asked, it would be maybe 90% of the folk would say, yeah, go to Sunday school or go to BB or go to this. You talk to folk in your generation, they would have said, well, I went to Sunday school three or four times on a Sunday. But those days are long gone. 
And therefore, the work of Gideon's is so, so important. I want to also thank John personally. John uh, said that he would love to come and, and give Bibles to our boys and girls, those involved in our uniformed organisations. We were delighted to hear that because the aim of our boys' brigade and the girls' brigade, it, we would love our children to come in and join themselves. See, of course we would. And it's important that they do. We, we want our children to develop socially and, 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 um, and, and we want them to develop in, in, as far as intelligence is concerned. But the most important thing, the reason why we reach out with the Boys' Brigade and the Girls' Brigade is we want them to come and find a saviour. And isn't that great that John said, listen, we want to give you a Bible. We want to give you a New Testament with the Psalms to help the boys and girls find Jesus. And so really we do appreciate uh, your kindness. And we're going to pray now for the work of Gideon's. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you and we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you're the Lord of all creation. We thank you, Lord, that you sent your son, Jesus. And as we read earlier on, you didn't come down just to educate people. You didn't just come down to have conversations with people. And that conversation with the women in the well just seems to be a chance conversation. Uh, They were walking along the road. They stopped for a rest. And this woman came for water. But we bless you because that's never the case. And we thank you that as Jesus talked about water, he was able to also to talk about her husband. But then he told her the most important thing of all. And we thank you that for her, her life was changed that day. For not only did she see a man sitting at a well, not only did she recognize that he was some great prophet, but she found the saviour of the world that day. And she was quick to tell others. And so we thank you for the work of the Gideons as they spread this good news, as they give out this letter from you. The folk will be able to have that same conversation with you as they read your word, as they consider your word. And so we do pray for these two billion Bibles. Lord, that's some figure. Many of those Bibles are probably lost. Many of those Bibles are probably in cupboards and and people don't know where they are. But there's also many of those Bibles are being read and people have found you through reading your word. And we bless you for that. And so we thank you for the work of the Gideons. We thank you for their ministry in East Belfast. We pray particularly as... As your word goes into the schools and for many of these children, they're not going to hear about you in the boys' brigade or the girls' brigade. They're not going to hear about you, Lord, at Sunday school. And so we pray, Lord, that as they read your word, that they will encounter you. For that woman in the well, she was never going to hear you from her neighbours, for they shunned her. She was never going to hear from the religious leaders in her community. Because they also shunned her. But she heard directly from you. And so we pray for these Bibles. That they will be used to draw young people to you. That they will find life. Life everlasting. That they will find the water. That water of life. Where they will not quench for drugs. And they will not quench for fame. And they will not quench... For the pursuit of money. But the thirst will be quenched by you. The living saviour. And so we thank you for the work of Gideon's. Continue to bless him. We thank you for the blessing. That they're to strand Presbyterian this day. As we have opportunity to work alongside them. As we give out your word. To the boys and the girls. Who come along to our organisations. Continue with us we ask. For we ask it. In Jesus' name. Amen. You'll be glad to know that I'm not going to preach. And, but we'll, we'll look at this passage uh, uh, next week. But I do want to, to make two plugs, if that's okay. I want to ask you to encourage you to come tonight. Uh, this is a special service. We have a number of ladies from the Northern Ireland uh, football team. Ladies can play football and, and they tend to be really good at it. 
and uh, and so therefore if you're free come along and uh, there's about seven of them coming although we're going to only interview three of them and and then russell is speaking if you're free come along if you have friends that you can invite along to the service tonight uh, please do that and it'll be great to see you the other plug is that uh, over the last few months we've been talking and thinking about how can we be more like jesus and and that's called discipleship and and, and that word is I suppose quite a complicated word and we were looking at a few weeks ago and probably a better word for us to understand is apprenticeship uh, we know that someone goes in and, and they know nothing about plumbing but after they've spent time with a plumber after studying uh, the rules of plumbing and seeing it done by someone who's an expert plumber then eventually they become a plumber and they learn how to be a plumber because they've seen it done. They've spent time with someone who's good at it. And we, we feel that sometimes when, whenever I'm preaching, I, I'm, I'm really good at saying, this is what you should do. You should do this, you should do that, and you should do another thing. And we thought, well, why don't we do a discipleship course? Uh, and of course, we can do it at any time, but we thought, we'll do it Sunday nights only because probably most of us are free on a Sunday night more than any other night during the week. And so we're holding it uh, over uh, a number of weeks. It'll be really two nights uh, a month. And um, we're running of this 22nd of October is the first night, next Sunday night. We're going to have it uh, instead of an, uh, uh, an evening service. And we would love everybody to come. And what we're trying to do with that is not so much me saying to you, this is what you should do, but actually coming alongside to say, this is how you do it. You know, because sometimes we all, we all know that we need to be better Christians. We all know that we should witness more. We all know that we should share our faith more. We, we, we all know that we should pray more. We all know that we should give more. We, we know these things. But sometimes we get frustrated because we really don't know actually how to do it. And, and this, this, this course is, is trying to help us to learn how to do it. There's two ways that we're going to do it. We're going to do teaching from, from the front here, and we're also going to do wee seminars. And you can choose whether you prefer just to being taught from the front, and, and so it'll be a bit like a normal order, a normal uh, evening service. Or you might prefer doing seminar type, and so therefore you'll be able to go in uh, and do some seminars. But we're really, really keen for all of us uh, to be involved in this. Uh, as I say, it's a way of how to it's not an, a way of saying, look, we're trying to get you to the evening service. That's not what it's about. We're just asking you to come to these eight evening services uh, and they finish at the end of, of January. And it's not the idea that once you do that, now that you come, why do you stay in the evening service? That's not the idea of it. The idea is saying, let's learn how to do it. Uh, and so we're really asking you that you, you will come and, and do that. You've received a new sheet and the back of that new sheet is, is, is the dates for those. So you don't need to come to any other evening service, but, but these are ones that we're asking you to come to and, and be committed to, uh, to learn how to be better at being a Christian, to be an apprentice of Jesus, to learn from him, to see how he does it, or maybe to see how other Christians do it, so that we can copy that. It is so much easier whenever we see somebody else do it and then we can copy that. So if you're free, we would love you to be free. In fact, we're asking you to be free. Uh, we're asking you that uh, to try and make that a priority to come. And uh, it's only eight services between now and the end of January. And that would be great. We're going to continue our service and we're going to sing a lovely hymn. It's a really old hymn, but it's a great hymn, The Old Rugged Cross. And we'll stand as we worship. <laughs>
part of our worship there this morning, we have an opportunity to present to God our tithes and our offerings. I'm going to sing again. We'll remain seated uh, to sing this next song. And the reason for that is during the sing of the next ho- song, we're going to collect our communion tokens. If you're visiting with us, we would love, if you love the Lord Jesus, we would love you to share uh, around this table. And you don't have a token, don't you worry about that. This is something that we Presbyterians do. And uh, it's we collect these wee tokens. And uh, just before we, we have communion service. And so while we sing this, these tokens... Uh, will be uh, collected and it's break thou the bread of life Absolutely delighted uh, to welcome Sylvia Shaw uh, to be full member in Confession of Faith uh, into our fellowship. Delighted uh, to have Sylvia join us. We have the table set before us, and, and, and sometimes we think, why is it we do this? About two or three years ago, I was over in Manchester with, with Eddie, uh, my good friend, and we were over to watch a football match, and on the Sunday morning, I went to church. And it was a Baptist church, and I was sitting in the Baptist church 
And this chap sitting next to me was from Poland. Uh, he was working in, in, in Man United and uh, he was going to go to the match and he had come to the church. He was invited to come along to this church. And this was the first time there'd been a church in this country. And he was sitting beside me. He had gone early and I was early and we were sitting chatting. Uh, and the folk came in and they laid the, the, the communion table just like this. And he said to me, that's amazing. He says, I've never seen that in my life before. And I said, what do you mean? And he says, I've never seen a church give out shots of vodka before. <laughs> and I thought, isn't that amazing that, that we actually know this table ever so well, and yet someone can come and totally misunderstand what this is about. And, and therefore, that's why it's important that every time we come around the table, that we remember what it's about, that we don't assume that we know what this is all about. And that's why we read what we call the words of institution. Paul writes to the church at Corinth, and there's lots of good things happening in this church, but there's some awful things happening. And one of the things that's happening in this church is they're misrepresenting what we're going to do today. They were taking this as an excuse to stuff their face and to get drunk. And he's really annoyed at this. And so he brings it back to basis, basics. And, and we're going to read just a few verses of what he says just to remind us what this is about. This isn't an empty ritual that we're involved in. This isn't something we do just because we're Presbyterian. We do because this is very much part of our faith. And we love to do it. And Paul reminds the church at Corinth why they should do it. And that same reminder is for me and you today. It's from 1 Corinthians 11. And he says this to the church so that to remind them what we're doing here. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And that's exactly what we're going to do. Let's pray together. Father God, we come and we thank you that as we gather around your table, that you are here. You are here to bless us, and you are here to witness our faith in you. You are here to listen to us as we speak to you, to tell you that we love you, for us to appreciate what you have done for us, dying on the cross. Just a couple of days ago, it was Friday the 13th, and lots of people were saying how unlucky it was and, and how they didn't want to do this or do that because it was Friday the 13th. And that has all come about because they saw Friday as an unlucky day because you died on the Friday. And for the disciples, that was a terrible day. But for us, we knew that after Friday comes Sunday. Resurrection Sunday, where you proved that when you died on the cross for our sins, it was effective because you rose on the Sunday proving that it was effective as you conquered sin and you conquered Satan and you conquered death. And with the Lord, we thank you that as we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we remember your death, not because it was unlucky or because it was sad, but because it brings us victory. So Lord, help us to worship you as we should. For we ask this 
In Jesus' name. Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and after he gave thanks, he broke it and he said, This is my body broken for you. Take and eat in memory of me. In the same way he took the cup and said, this is a new covenant in my blood. Every time you drink it, you remember me.
Father, we come and we thank you that we have an opportunity to remember your death. Lord, we cannot imagine the suffering that you went through. Sometimes we just focus on on the physical pain that you had and the emotional pain that you had. And both of those must have been really awful. But they wouldn't have been any different to the same pain that the two thieves on the other side of you also suffered. No, the suffering that we cannot imagine is when you, the son, sinless Son of God, took upon your body our sin. What that meant for you, we have no idea. But it was awful. So bad that you cried out, Father, why have you forsaken me? We can't imagine. But we can enjoy the benefit of that. And so we tell you now, Lord, we love you and we appreciate, even though we can't imagine. And we <laughs> promise that we will live lives to honor you, living as a new creation. Forgive us when we've become a wee bit like that church at Corinth at times when they took your grace and your love for granted. And they thought they could do what they liked because you would always forgive them. Forgive us, Lord, when we do that. And help us to reflect your character. For as your children, we should reflect our Heavenly Father. And the great thing is we're able to do that because you're given to each one of us the gift of your Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives within us. And that makes it possible for us to glorify you in the things that we say, in the things that we do, in the things that we think. And so as we leave this table, rejoicing. Rejoicing that your death has brought us life. Rejoicing that your death has brought us the gift of your spirit living within us. That we will go forward into this day and this week to live for you and to shine for you and to be your light in the darkness. Lead us and guide us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Our final hymn focuses on the cross of Jesus. The reason it does that is to remind us who Jesus is, what he's done for us, and who we are in him. When I survey the wondrous cross, we'll stand as we worship.
and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and reign with each one of us now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Just to sit here, John's going to be at the front here. If you have any questions on the Gideons, John will be able to answer them. He knows all about Gideon work. And uh, so if you'd like to see him, come forward. If you want to have a look to see what he has, feel free to come forward too. Thank you.